Reverend John Scott, who is bringing us a message of hope and love and peace, and maybe some homework. Reverend John? Good morning and happy Easter to you, my spiritual family worldwide. How wonderful it is to greet you on this glorious Easter morning and to know that the truth that we celebrate is that we can arise above all challenges, all difficulties. We can emerge from the tomb of doubt and desperation into the glorious sunlight of an Easter morning that just holds us close to the everlasting heart of divine love. Thank you, Carol, for that lovely introduction. As she mentioned in her inspirational reading from Ernest Holmes 365, and I quote, let us turn toward the sun, and that's S-U-N, of eternal life. And we do that deliberately and definitely as we let go of every lost hope, every fear, every sense of lack, every hurt, because today, says Holmes, we leave the tomb of doubt and enter the sanctuary of certainty. What a wonderful thing it is to be certain of the truth of our Christhood, the truth that Jesus taught that we are all divine and that we all are part of that amazing experience that Jesus made our story, the Easter story. And you know, friends, that story reminds me of our Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living Thriving Ministry Initiative, which has uh, in our, it, it has four quadrants, and one of the quadrants is the consciousness raising quadrant. And the, the tagline of that quadrant is every encounter an opportunity to raise consciousness. Just think about that. Every time we encounter anyone, either virtually as we are doing now on all the various platforms or in person, we have an opportunity to raise consciousness, to lift people up. And so my encouragement this morning is titled, You Raise Me Up. And I think about that first encounter Mary Magdalene had with the master teacher Jesus outside the empty tomb and how it must have altered her life when she turned around from the empty tomb and beheld the master in the garden. At first she didn't recognize him. Let me read you the story from John 20 verses 1 to 17, and I'm reading from the King James Version. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and come first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own homes, but Mary stood without the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus lay. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? 
And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if, if they have borne him hence, tell me where they have laid him, that, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and she said, Rabboni. I can just hear her, oh my goodness, it's you. Which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. The end of that scripture. And that, those words of Jesus, I ascend unto my father and your father. So we, have a sh we, sh we, sh we share the same father to my God and your God. So Jesus' whole message was we are one. We are one. When he said I am the father are one, he didn't mean that he had an exclusive patent on that. He meant that all of us, all humanity, is one with the Father, that indwelling presence and power he called Father. You know, friends, when the stone from the tomb of doubt and fear within our mind is removed, a conscious resurrection takes place, and we make that indwelling spirit our own experience. But first, we have to cross out the stuff and nonsense that the world would have us believe. And we all have examples of that. We know the, the purveyors of materialism say if you wear this outfit and live in this community and drive this car and have the latest Android, then you have arrived. You know, you're it. And if you don't, as we say in Jamaica, you're nice and nothing. You're not saying anything. You're not enough. But our Rastafarian brethren here in Jamaica have a term. They talk about the liberty. And that is what Jesus taught that the life was to be abundant. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundant. And that liberty is the embracing of all the good, all the joy, all the love, all the perfection that is ours by divine right of being. And so, my friends, we find ourselves in a situation as we are now with a worldwide pandemic. And suddenly, all of the material things seem to have lost their meaning, haven't they? Suddenly we, we begin to have a, a deeper appreciation of a hug, time with family, the ability to be quiet, the freedom to move about, because when it is removed, you then think, the small things that I took for granted are really the important things in my life. And you begin to take stock and to reevaluate our values. And one of those values that I, I find are, is just so central to people who raise us up and who, who help us. You, now the world is talking about the value of uh, the workers, the, the people in the emergency room, the doctors, the nurses. On, on Thursday, the garbage collectors came to my neighborhood and I suddenly thought, wow, God bless you, you're out. When all of us are, are safely at home collecting my garbage, I sent them a real blessing. And so our values are beginning to shift, and we're beginning to put the emphasis on the things that really matter to humanity. And one of those things is faithfulness, the faithfulness that, that is just so important when the people who we treasure lift us up. So I have an assignment for you. Carol promised you that I might give you an assignment. And since you are at home, you can't go outside. This assignment is one that I want you to go inside into your consciousness and do. I want you over this Easter weekend to take stock, to look at what are the things in your life that you need to cross out, to crucify, to get rid of, so that you can rise above them into a new Easter morning of accomplishment. And I want you also, as part of your assignment, to write a list of all the people in your life who have helped to raise you up. Write their names down on a sheet of paper or in your journal. And beside each name, write the qualities that they have brought into your relationship that have made you so value them as a part of your journey uh, in life. And just give thanks, you know, just say as you read each name, you raise me up and I'm so grateful. So I want to share a story with you, a teaching story about faithfulness, which 
uh, was written by a woman called Rachel Naomi Remen in a book titled My Grandfather's Blessings, published by Riverhead Books. For her fourth birthday, Rachel's grandfather brought her a little paper cup full of dirt. She was disappointed with the gift and let him know that in no uncertain terms. In response, grandfather simply smiled and then turned to pick up a small teapot from her doll's tea set. He took her to the kitchen and filled it up with water. They went back into the nursery and he set the cup on the windowsill and gave Rachel the teapot. He then said, if you promise to put some water in this cup every day, something amazing may happen. And so, you know, with ch childlike glee and curiosity, Rachel began to do as she was told. But as the days passed, she found it harder and harder to keep up the task. Sounds familiar? Sometimes when we set out on an exercise program or to do something regularly, we start off with all the enthusiasm, and then as the days pass, we get slightly bored of it and tired of it, and before you know what, we're no longer doing it. Well, that happened to little Rachel. And at one point, she even tried to give the cup back to her grandfather. She said, here, you take it. But he simply told her she had to keep it up every single day. With much effort then, she did just that. And eventually she woke up one morning and there she saw two small green leaves sprouting out of the soil. She was amazed by what she saw. And every day she watched the plant grow bigger and bigger. When she saw her grandfather again, she told him about it and thinking that he would be as excited and amazed as, and surprised as she was. But of course we know he wasn't. The grandfather explained to her how life was everywhere. Life is everywhere and is hidden in the most ordinary and unlikely places. Rachel was excited by this and asked, and, and, and Grandpa, all it needs is water? Her grandfather touched her gently on top of her head and he said, no, Rachel, all it needs is your faithfulness. The faithfulness of your love, my friends, will make the most amazing things grow in your life. But you have to stick with it, even when the, it seems that there is only barren dirt in the, in the pot. Know that below the surface, life is doing its own perfect thing. And in the fullness of time, with our faithfulness, life will emerge in all its beauty to blossom and bear fruit and bless us with what it is we have planted. So you know, my friends, often the people who raise us up demonstrate this quality of faithfulness. They have watered us even when they weren't getting any results out of us, don't they? In our Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life program at the, the prison here in Kingston, we had a class, uh, one of our classes, uh, we had a discussion around forgiveness. And there was a young man, uh, an angry young man uh, in the class, who couldn't get over the fact that his best friend had betrayed him. And in fact, he attributed his incarceration to the fact that this friend had betrayed his, his trust. And so, you know, he was consumed with anger and, and, and grief at this betrayal. But he discovered in the fullness of time that there in the prison, in that barren, apparent wasteland of human endeavor and humanity, he discovered his, his life's purpose. His purpose, he discovered, was to be a revealer of truth, to be a minister, and to preach the gospel. And so he's spending his time in prison studying theology. How do you like that? So he has come to the recognition that out of the betrayal, has come something wonderful. And I pointed out to him that there, should, there may be a, a parallel with the Judas story, yes? That sometimes a betrayal may even lead to a crucifixion. And then after that, the glorious resurrection, the triumph over what had appeared to be the desolation and the hardship and the pain that we had experienced. I believe, my friends, that, that we are indeed blessed not only to be witnessing a time of great spiritual awakening as a, as a spiritual movement, but that we are being called to take a leadership role in the creation of a world that works for all. Ernest Holmes, the founder 
of our great teaching known as the science of mind, writes in his book, Living the Science of Mind, and I quote, we need to know with scientific certainty that there is a consciousness and a power in the universe that responds to us definitely, directly, and dynamically. Each individual must arrive at a place in his own consciousness where this contact is so immediate and so dynamic that if every other living soul denied it, he would still know. And that's the end of the Ernest Holmes quote. Let us know together the truth that the resurrecting power of the Christ, and remember the Christ wasn't Jesus' last name, the Christ is the concept and the principle of your sonship and your daughtership with the living spirit almighty. And when you are in tune with that principle, then you can rise above all seeming challenges. Truly, that principle of Christhood can raise you up so that you can be all that you, you wish to be, all that you dream of being, all that you envision for yourself and for your life. The resurrection, my friends, then is an organic change that takes place daily in all who are conforming their lives to the regenerating truth taught by Jesus. And he said in John 4, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Can we say that together with him? I am the resurrection and the life. The Easter season then, my friends, is a universal call to change, a springtime reminder that there is a power in the universe that supports our spiritual journey on this plane and beyond. And you know, as you think about those people who have raised you up, I want you just to remember that you also are in the business of raising other people up. And I just learned a beautiful meditation that I wanted to share with you, um, a beautiful gesture. And it is to place your hand on your heart, and I will pray, and at the end of the prayer, I'll tell you what I want you to do. This is an affirmative prayer of resurrection. As we recognize together the perfect and perfecting presence and power that raises us up to a greater appreciation of the glory and greatness of that which is in all, through all, over all, all in all, as all. That spirit raises us up in ways that are totally unique to our own personality and our own gifts and asks us to share that gift, the gift of our self, the gift of our consciousness, the gift of the truth of our humanity, revealing our divinity with a world that hungers and thirsts for right useness of this amazing law, the law of mind, the law of love, the law that is doing its work of perfecting all that needs to be perfected on planet Earth at this time and so we say to the spirit within us you raise me up and I am willing to go forth to raise others up in the consciousness of their divinity to behold the Christ in each person that I see and to know that at the center of all human endeavor is that radiant Christ that lifts all things up to all that they can be and so right now, I want you just to sweep your hand across your heart and then put your ring finger and your thumb together and just send that love that was in your, is, is in your heart out to the world, out to everyone in your experience, to the healthcare workers, to the police and the essential services, to the garbage collectors, to the people who are homeschooling their children, to all those who need a resurrection this morning, we raise you up as we have been raised by the consciousness of the Christ to the honor and glory of God. This word is now released to law in thanksgiving for its perfect fulfillment, and I give thanks 
I truly give thanks as I recognize that each of you is the resurrection and the life. God loves you and so do I. Namaste.